The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for five minutes. Did the FBI pay Christopher Steele and was the dossier the basis for securing warrants at the FISA court to spy on Americans associated with the Trump campaign? Really, when you sum it all up, it boils, it boils down to those fundamental questions. Did you pay the guy who wrote it? And did you use what he wrote, disproven, discredited dossier paid for by the Clinton campaign? Did you use it to go get warrants to spy on Americans? That's what it comes down to. And you're the guy who can answer those questions. And I was yesterday I was convinced that the answer to those questions was probably yes. But today I'm even more convinced the answer is yes, based on the text messages we got to read early this morning. Mr. Rosenstein, you know Peter Strzok, you familiar with that name? I, yes, I'm familiar with the name. And, or, uh, former I'm Deputy Head of Counterintelligence at the FBI. Peter Strzok, that one? I, I don't know his precise title, but yes, he had a significant role in- Peter Strzok ran the Clinton campaign, interviewed Mills, Abedin, and Clinton, changed the exoneration letter from gross negligence to extreme carelessness. Peter Strzok, who ran the Russian investigation, interviewed Mike Flynn. Peter Strzok selected by Mr. Mueller to be on his team. That Peter Strzok, we learned, had all these text messages. We got to read some of them early this morning. Now, as, as my colleagues have pointed out, some of them are, you know, they show he didn't like Trump. He and Ms. Page are exchanging text messages back and forth, show they don't like the president. But that's nothing new. Everyone on Mueller's team, no one on Mueller's team likes Trump. We already knew that. But I want to focus on one in particular. One in particular. And this, uh, this is a text message from Mr. Strzok to Ms. Page recalling a conversation and a meeting that took place in Andy, uh, Andrew McCabe's office, deputy director of the FBI, recalling a meeting earlier. And Mr. Strzok says this, I want to believe the path you threw out for consideration in Andy's office. Then there's a break. Dash, it says that there's no way he gets elected, no way Trump gets elected. He says, I want to believe that. You said that in the meeting in Andrew McCabe's office. I want to believe that. But then he goes, but I'm afraid we can't take that risk. Now, this goes to intent. He says, we can't take the risk. Of, you know, the people of this great country might elect Donald Trump president. We can't take this risk. This is Peter Strzok, head of counterintelligence at the FBI. This is Peter Strzok, who I think had a hand in that dossier that was all dressed up and taken to the FISA court. He's saying, we can't take the risk. We have to do something about it. Now, don't forget the timeline here either, Mr. Rosenstein. Peter Strzok, January 10th, he's the guy who changes the exoneration letter from gross negligence, criminal standard to extreme carelessness. July 2nd, he's the guy who sets in on the Clinton interview. July 5th, 2016, that's when Comey has the press conference says, we're not going to prosecute. Clinton's okay. We're not going to prosecute. And then August 2016, we have this text message. The same month that the Russian investigation is opened at the FBI, August 2016, and my guess is that's the same month that the application was taken to the FISA court to get the warrants to spy on Americans. Using this dossier that the Clinton campaign paid for, Democrats paid for, fake news, all dressed up, taken to the court. So I got really just a couple basic questions. Because it seems to me if the answer to any of, these, of those two questions, if the answer is yes, if you guys paid... Christopher Steele, at the same time the Democrats in the Clinton campaign were painting, or if you took the dossier, dressed it all up, took it to the FISA court, and used that as the basis to get warrants, and now we have intent in this, in this text message saying, that, there's another text message, my colleague referenced it earlier, where Mr. Strzok says, I can protect our country at many levels, says it with all the humility he could muster. I can protect our country at many levels. This guy thought he was super agent James Bond at the FBI. This is obvious. I'm afraid we can't take that risk. We can't, there's no way we can let the American people make Donald Trump the next president. I gotta protect our country. This is unbelievable. And I'm here to tell you, Mr. Rosenstein, I think the public trust in this whole thing is gone. So it seems to me you got two things you can do. You're the guy in charge. You're the guy who picked Mueller. You're the guy who wrote the memo saying why he needed to fire Comey. You're the guy in charge. You could disband the Mueller special prosecutor and you can do what we've all called for. Appoint a second special counsel to look into this, to look into Peter Strzok, Bruce Orr, everything else we've learned in the last several weeks. Yes, Congressman, and uh, I can assure you that I consider it very important to make sure the thorough review is done. 
Uh, and our inspector general is doing a thorough review. That's how we found those text messages as part of that review. Let me, you've, said, you've given that answer like 15 times. Let me ask you this. Are you concerned? I mean, this is what a lot of Americans are believing right now, and I certainly do, that the Comey FBI and the Obama Justice Department worked with one campaign to go after the other campaign. That's what everything points to. Think about what we've learned in the last several weeks. We, we first learned they paid for the dossier. Then we learned about Peter Strzok. And last week, we learned about Bruce Orr and his wife, Nellie. I mean, this is unbelievable. So what's it going to take to get a second special counsel to answer these questions and find out, was Peter Strzok really up to what I think he was? I, I think it's important to understand, Congressman, we have an inspector general who has 500 employees and a $100 million budget. Uh, and this is what he does. He investigates allegations of misconduct involving department employees. That review that he is conducting is what turned up those text messages. It will also involve interviews of those persons and of other witnesses. So we're looking forward to his report, and we've met with Mr. Horowitz, and we're anxiously awaiting that report. But that doesn't dismiss the fact that the country thinks we need a second special counsel. 20 members of this committee, the Judiciary Committee, with primary jurisdiction over the Justice Department, thinks we need a second special counsel. All kinds of senators think we need a special counsel. <coughs> what fact pattern do you have to have? What kind of text message do you have to see before you say it's time for a second special counsel? I want to assure you, Congressman, as I think the Attorney General explained, we take very seriously the concerns of 20 members of this committee or one member of this committee. But we have a responsibility to make an independent determination, and we will. Right, thank the chair. A gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. The reason we have special counsel, this is a very important point, the re and you know it. The reason we have special counsel is because of a conflict of interest. The regulation itself specifically makes reference to a conflict of interest. And, and we don't like conflicts of interest because it undercuts people's confidence in both the process and the result. So, so let's be really clear why we have special counsel. There was either a real or perceived conflict of interest that we were fearful would either impact the result or people's confidence in the process. That's why we have something called special counsel, and that's why we have special counsel in this fact pattern and then lo and behold, uh, those who are supposed to make sure there um, are no conflicts of interest seem to have a few of their own. Uh, there's a senior prosecutor who sent obsequious emails to a fact witness. I, she can be described as nothing other than a fact witness. She's a really important fact witness if you pursue the line of inquiry that my Democrat friends want to pursue. They got off of collusion and now they're on obstruction of justice. She may be the most important fact witness in an obstruction of justice case. And the senior prosecutor for this conflict of interest free special counsel sent a fawning obsequious email to a fact witness. And then we have prosecutors assigned to conduct this investigation who donated almost exclusively to one candidate over another, and then we have a prosecutor assigned to this conflict of interest free team that attended what was supposed to be, what he'd hoped to be, a victory party for Secretary Clinton. And we have a senior DOJ official, Mr. Deputy Attorney General, with an office that used to be two doors down from yours, meeting with Fusion GPS. And Fusion GPS, of course, was paying for Russian dirt on the very person that they're supposed to be objectively investigating. And then that same senior DOJ official's wife, the one that met with Fusion GPS, his wife was on the payroll of Fusion GPS. And then we have a senior agent assigned to investigate Secretary Clinton's email, help draft the exoneration letter where we change the language from grossly negligent to extremely careless, interviewed Secretary Clinton in an interview I've never seen, and I doubt you have either in your career as a prosecutor, interviewed Michael Flynn, was actively involved in the investigation into the Trump campaign before the Inspector General found his text. So this agent in the middle of almost everything related to Secretary Clinton and President Trump sent pro-Clinton texts, anti-Trump texts to his paramour, in response to being told maybe 
he is where he is to protect the country from that menace, Donald Trump, he said, I can protect our country at many levels. And then he said Hillary Clinton should win 100 million to nothing. Now think about that, Mr. Deputy Attorney General. That's a pretty overwhelming victory. 100 million to zero. And then he went on, if that weren't enough, to belittle Trump supporters by saying he could smell them at a Walmart in Virginia. This is the person we needed to avoid a conflict of interest. And then he said this, they fully deserve to go and demonstrate the absolute bigoted nonsense of Trump. But he wasn't content to just disparage Donald Trump. He had to disparage Donald Trump's family. This is what he said, Mr. Deputy Attorney General. He said, the douchebags are about to come out. He's talking about our first lady and children, this conflict of interest-free special agent of the FBI. This is who we were told we needed to have an objective, impartial, fair, conflict of interest free investigation. So he's openly pulling for the candidate he had a role in clearing, and he's openly investigating a candidate that he has bias against. And then if that's not enough, he says Trump is an effing idiot. What the F just happened to our country? This is the same man that said he would save our country. What happens when people who are supposed to cure the conflict of interest have even greater conflicts of interest than those they replace? Well, I, that, that, that's not a rhetorical question. It, you nor I nor anyone else would ever sit Peter Strzok on a jury. We wouldn't have him objectively, dispassionately investigate anything knowing what we know now. Why didn't we know it ahead of time? And, and, and my last question, my final question to you, and I appreciate the chairman's patience. How would you help me answer that question when I go back to South Carolina this weekend? Congressman, uh, first of all, with regard to the special counsel, uh, Mr. Strzok was already working on the investigation when the special counsel was appointed. The appointment that I made was a Robert Mueller. So what I'd recommend that you tell your constituents is that uh, Robert Mueller and Rod Rosenstein and Chris Ray are accountable and that we will ensure that no bias is reflected in any of the actions taken by the special counsel or in any matter uh, within the jurisdiction of the Department of Justice. Uh, you should tell your constituents uh, that we exposed this issue because we're ensuring that the Inspector General conducts a thorough and effective investigation, and if there is any evidence of impropriety, he's going to surface it and report about it publicly. I'll try.